Greetings, ladies and gentlemen of the internet. I am Speedy4, and welcome back to a brand new episode of Macho 64, the show where I basically pick a game and talk about it. But this time, we'll be taking a look at a particular game that I had set aside until I reached a thousand subscribers. And wouldn't you know it, the moment I posted episode 8 and then finished episode 9, I managed to reach my goal of a thousand subscribers. So, not only is this the 1,000 subscriber special, but it's also episode 10. Funny how everything works out. But, today we're going to be taking a look at another Sonic game. But this time, we're going to be taking a look at the Blue Blur's most awkward title. Sonic 2006. Yes, and what do you think of me? You really want to know? Yes, show me your hatred. Let me feel your disdain towards me! Actually, to be honest, I kind of like Sonic 2006. Wait, what? <laughs> Before you start sharpening your pitchforks and lighting your torches, allow me to explain why I like this game. But I want to apologize for how long this video has taken me to make. I guess with Sonic I try to take my time, but I think this video has taken me just as long as it has taken me to make the Sonic Adventure video. Or at least it feels like that. But this part is a little unscripted, and we'll get into the video shortly, but I just want to take this time to thank everyone who has gotten me to a thousand subscribers and for the sole reason I'm making this 1,000 subscriber special in the first place. It really means a lot to me that you guys like my content and want to see more of it. And I already have a bunch of ideas I want to tackle in the future while I was making this video, which is why in addition to the 1,000 subscriber special, I'll also include a public poll on my Patreon that both you, my viewers, and my wonderful patrons on Patreon can vote on what I cover for episode 11 at the same time this video goes live. So think of it as my way of saying thank you for subscribing and for helping me reach this milestone, but also as a treat in picking what the next episode of Matra 64 will talk about. But for now, let's talk about this game's origins. It was 2005, and at the E3 of that year, and at the Tokyo Game Show, Sega and Sonic Team announced that a brand new Sonic title would be released for the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. They later brought it to PC. All in time for Sonic's yeah. 15th anniversary, and this title was just called Sonic the Hedgehog. But later, the world would come to know this game as Sonic 2006. Sonic Team was pushing it as the future of the Sonic franchise by showing lots of cool things about the game. Like an epic trailer, a demo of the Level Kingdom Valley, and showing off the graphics. This game would come to use the Havoc engine developed by Telekinesis Research LTD. And it looked like the game used it pretty well, but Things beyond that point was, well, chaotic. But why is this exactly? Well, it's actually due to two things. First, Yuji Naka had resigned as the head of Sonic Team during the process, so in a way, they lost their guy. And second, Sonic Team was split into two separate teams. While one team worked on Sonic 2006, the other team would later turn a Wii port of Sonic 2006 into a fractured little gem called Sonic and the Secret Rings. And <laughs> no, don't you worry. I'll be talking about Secret Rings some other time, I promise you. But back to Sonic 2006. The other thing that really made things worse was that Sony and Microsoft were rushing Sega to meet their deadline of November 14th, 2006 in order to make it for the Christmas shopping season. And when it was completed, Sonic Team was so desperate to get this game out to market, they would later ignore the bug reports they received, and that is why this game is so buggy and glitchy. Yes, you heard me right. They intentionally ignored bug reports just to get the game out. And after being on the market for a good mm, half a month, Critics gave this game a whole range of scores. I mean, we got things like 4.8 out of 10 to 8.5 out of 10, and it's all over the place. So, 
What could this mean exactly? Well, yes, I do agree there are just some things that are just bad in design and decision, but this game does have some good things going for it. No! Y you lie! I have no redeeming qualities whatsoever! Oh, really? <laughs> hey! Let's take a look, shall we? Whee! So, right off the bat, we're introduced to the main city of the game, Soliana. And it is currently having its Festival of the Sun ceremony to celebrate their sun god, Solaris. However, the ceremony is rudely interrupted by a certain egg-shaped doctor. He then confronts the princess of Soliana, being this lady, named Princess Elise. He is demanding something called the Flames of Disaster, and the Chaos Elmo she currently has in her possession. Now, you're probably wondering, how'd she get a Chaos Emerald? Where on earth did she get it? Well, that'll be explained later. For now, let's look at the one thing we're currently looking at. The visuals. Right off the bat, you'll notice how realistic everything looks. The thing about Sonic games at this time was how freaking cinematic the cutscenes were in Sonic games. I mean, when Sonic Adventure and Sonic Adventure 2 came onto the scene, Sega must have taken a page from Square Enix book, cause BAM! CG cutscenes with a heavy emphasis on action and storytelling. And with each game, they really upped their craft. And Sonic 2006 was no exception. But, I think when this was made for Sonic's 15th anniversary, they not only wanted to push Sonic in a different direction than normal, but also go all out with their cutscenes. However, if you were to ask me about my thoughts on the art direction, honestly, I think it was a bad choice. A prime example is our egg-shaped doctor here. I mean, he doesn't look bad per se, but he looks off. This Eggman is more slim looking and less egg-shaped. He's round, yes, but he's less of an egg and more of an avocado in terms of shape. Also, with the way he's rendered, he looks like a rejected F-Zero yes. pilot. Which is funny when you realize Sega actually developed F-Zero GX. I feel that the realistic art style for the people was one of the things that really held back Sonic 2006. Eventually, they would remedy this situation with more cartoony designs used in Sonic Unleashed, which looks miles better, and more fitting in a Sonic game. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. While Mr. Freeshabakadu here threatens the princess, all of a sudden, a blue wind breezes by and all the robots get wrecked. And it's revealed that this blue wind is our favorite blue hedgehog, Sonic. He manages to run away with the leaves in his arms. We also get a quick look at a mysterious gray hedgehog named Silver, claiming that he has found the Iblis Tripper. What are his intentions? We will find out in due time. Getting back to Sonic though, he did manage to rescue Elise, but as Sonic was dealing with some robots, Eggman managed to kidnap Elise, and before she gets whisked away, she tosses the Chaos Emerald she had to Sonic. And now, we have to rescue her. We then later meet up with Tails, grab our first upgrade at the shop, and make our way to Stage 1. Wave Ocean. Can I just say how much I like this level? I mean, look at it, it's beautiful! The water, the trees, even the robots who want to kill me look good! But this level also makes me reminisce about playing Emerald Coast from Sonic Adventure for the first time. I mean, if you were to put the music from Emerald Coast on Wave Ocean, it'd work just as well. In fact... There we go. I mean, they even have Sonic being chased by an orca. What is it with orcas chasing Sonic? But this time, Sonic is holding on to an orca as it jumps in and out of the water. Apparently, we don't want this orca to leave, so he calls out the tails to close the gate, 
and we get to control Tails for a second. However, unlike the previous time we got to play as Tails, he plays more like he did in Sonic Heroes instead of how he controlled in Sonic Adventure. He can only fly and throw dummy rings, which is kind of lame to be honest. It made sense for Tails to throw explosive dummy rings in Sonic Heroes because he was part of a team. Tails was the flight member, and flight members are meant for support. But I honestly think he would have benefited from him controlling like he did in Sonic Adventure. But I'll talk about my thoughts later. After managing to close the gate, we then get... A loading screen. Well, might as well get used to these, because here we have another thing about Sonic 2006 that everybody dislikes. The loading times. Now, to be honest, they're not that bad, but when you have a loading screen that lasts 22 seconds and 27 milliseconds, that's a little unbearable. And I feel like the reason the load times were so long was because how poorly optimized the game is. Sure, it runs, and dare I say, it even functions. But there's a lot about Sonic 2006 that could have been fine-tuned, which beautifully leads me into what comes after this loading screen, the mock speed running sections. However, before I do, let's talk about the gameplay of Sonic 2006. Like the previous Sonic games, like Adventure, Adventure 2, and Heroes, you can play as other characters, either Sonic, Shadow, or new addition to the Sonic roster, Silver. But during certain levels in a certain section, you can play as other characters depending on which story you picked. And yes, there's more than one. If you pick Sonic Story, you can play as yeah. Sonic and control Tails Sweet. or not. Right. If you pick Shadow Story, you can play as okay. Shadow and control Rouge, yes, or E-123 Omega. And if you pick Silver Story, you can play as Silver, Great. and control Good. Blaze, or Amy. Yay. Super Mario. <coughs> Horrible joke. <coughs> and each character plays differently from the main character. Like, Tails can fly and throw dummy rings, like I mentioned before, but there's also Rouge, who can glide and climb walls, or Blaze, who can use her pyrokinetic ability. But let's discuss Sonic for a second. Sonic controls somewhat like he did in Sonic Adventure 2. He can run, do a homing attack, jump, do a leg sweep? Okay. And finally, the spin attack. As much as I like the spin attack, it's very wonky in this game. We don't really need it and it hardly ever gets used. I mean, you can get through these levels without it. Heck, there were very little times I spin dashed. Now, the goal of the Sonic level is to complete a certain objective and reach the goal rate. But one section in some of the Sonic levels are the mock speed running levels. These are something that are super flawed. I mean, I get what they were trying to go for, a place where Sonic could run at full speed! But there are some problems with this. First off, running into something will either A, knock every ring out of you, or B, flat out kill you! This is due to Sonic running so fast, even something as harmless like a box becomes a weapon against you. Sonic is always running, but the turning is very loose, and the jumping feels like you're floating in the air! and sometimes the collision is off. But it's nothing too frustrating, at least in this level. Anyway, let's get back to the main story. After getting through Wave Ocean, we then find out Eggman takes her to the Desert Ruins. We don't know why he goes there, but it probably pertains to the Flames of Disaster. We then find Elise in a chamber, but before we can rescue her, BOSS FIGHT! This is the first boss, but it already looks cool. This is Egg Cerberus. Although, it's less of a Cerberus and more of a Bargas. That was a mythology joke. So, in order for you to damage the boss, you have to grind on its tail, then down its back, and grab its antenna to ram its head into a wall! It's a really fun boss. Sometimes you'll get a few physics hiccups here and there, but I feel it's a fun boss. So, after we're done giving the donkey a concussion, we manage to escape. But, oh no, what's this? A swarm of robots is coming after us! 
Tails offers to distract the robots, allowing Sonic and Elise to escape. And we immediately get into Stage 2, Dusty Desert. If I have one thing to say about this stage, is that it's weird. Don't get me wrong, I like how it looks, and the way the sun hits the level is just... <clears throat> aesthetic. But throughout the entire level, Sonic is carrying Elise. But that's not the weird part. Although it is pretty funny to see Sonic do a homing attack while carrying a person. The weird thing about this level is that you can't walk on the sand. Like, at all. If you try to walk on the sand, you'll sink and lose a life. I'm sorry, but in a previous cutscene, wasn't everyone walking on the sand earlier? So why is it now that we're not allowed to step foot on it? How are we supposed to walk on the sand? Well, by holding the right trigger, you can activate a shield by tapping into Elise's power, allowing you to not only walk on the sand, but destroy any enemies you run into upon contact. Now, what is her power? Who knows? It'll get explained later, but for now, it's just a weird game mechanic, and it will appear in a later level. But the level itself, eh, it's decent. It's your typical desert level with sand and ancient ruins, but overall, it's decent. So, after our trip to Dusty Desert, we then make it into a grassy plain. Elise thanks Sonic for saving her, and bandages his arm after seeing he was injured. Even though I don't see an injury. Regardless, she then goes into what the flames of disaster are. So, to put it simply, they are Solaris's judgment. The people of Soliana almost felt the full wrath of Solaris's anger ten years ago. But Elise's father, who was the king of Soliana, stopped Solaris, but at the cost of his own life. She's concerned that Eggman is looking to unleash said flames to bring the world into ruin. Now, why he would want to do that? I have no idea. Maybe so he can rebuild it afterwards and make it his own? I mean, that's a thing Eggman dreams about, right? Well, getting back on topic, after a cute scene of Sonic telling Elise to run, not from danger, but just because it's fun to do, which is fitting with Sonic's character, since he's a carefree guy who has little strife and is free like the wind. It's a cute scene, yes, but if you sense some sort of connection, I'll get into that later. Man, there's a lot of things I need to get into later. Hopefully I won't need a list, but trust me when I say this, I will talk about all of this. Did you just gesture to all of me? Why, yes. Yes, I did. So, back to the game. Sonic and Elise managed to make it back into Castletown. But then, suddenly... They're attacked by a wave of energy. Luckily, Sonic managed to dodge in time. And we are then introduced to Silver the Hedgehog. He claims that Sonic is something called the Iblis Trigger, and that his actions would condemn everyone in the future. And so he's here to take Sonic out. I mean, to kill him. Not treat him to a nice dinner. Not that kind of taking out. Boss fight! Here, we fight Silver the Hedgehog. And this is another thing that's flawed in Sonic 2006. See, Silver can use his telekinetic powers. He attacks by throwing things at us. And we have to attack when he's vulnerable. But if you try to attack before so... It's no use! He'll grab you and fling you away! Which is nothing too troublesome, but if he flings you into a section of wall and you don't get away in time, he'll repeatedly grab you and fling you into the wall, and in most cases, you'll die. But if he flings you into a section of wall in just the wrong way, you'll keep retaking the same ring over and over again, causing you to never die and suffer an eternal stream of It's no use! It's no use. It's no use. It's no use. <laughs> Make it stop! <laughs> but I know how to properly fight against Silver, and I don't ever run into this issue. All you have to do 
is keep your distance. Wait for Silver to grab some tables and chairs and immediately close in. Hit him with a homing attack and run away! Which is easy to do considering we're fighting in a courtyard. A nice, big, open space. But the fact that many a poor soul suffered through Silver's antics and the fact that his line of It's no use! is so ingrained into the collective consciousness that there are people that reference this line even if they've never played Sonic 2006. These fights, where Sonic fights another character, harkens back to the rival battles in the adventure games. But the issue here is that Silver's AI is programmed in a way that constantly homes in towards you and keeps attacking you even if you're in those iframes. giving you a chance to run away, maybe collect a ring and be on your guard. But Silver is just so darn eager to beat the living shit out of you that he makes a beeline for you. He's like that one kid in gym class who immediately rushes towards the dodgeballs and immediately pelts you in the face. <laughs> Let's get busy. It's no use. Uh oh, take this. Never cuts us any as long as you keep your distance from him, you'll be fine. So, after we defeat Silver, he then sucker punches Sonic with his mind. Silver seems unimpressed, and while all of this is happening, Elise gets kidnapped, and Sonic tries to chase after her, but Silver is like, Hold it! As he attempts to finish Sonic, he is stopped by. <gasps> The best girl, Amy Rose. She blocks the way, allowing Sonic to get away and rescue Elise. Now you're probably wondering how Silver and Amy know each other, but again, like I said, you're here. Yeah. I swear, guys, I promise I'll talk about it. However, now we must follow Eggman into New City. Ah, uh, yes. New City. I love living in New City. Why, I happen to live in fancy apartments and I always visit the great pizza shop on Narrow Street. I then go to Game Store where I buy the latest copy of AAA First Person Military Shooter. Game of the Year Edition. Really? New City? That is the most generic name for a fictional city I've ever heard of. And I have a poster for a place called Alterville. I know there's other things I could complain about, but this just drives the creative part of my brain nuts. Go, 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 go. Why not call this section of Soliana something else, like Neo Soliana or Donville? Anyway, generic names aside, Sonic and Tails find Knuckles looking super suave. He tosses Sonic a card. <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding. It's actually a message from Dr. Eggman. He states that if Sonic wants Elise to be freed, he must meet him in his base in White Acropolis and exchange Elise for the Chaos Emerald she tossed him. Obviously knowing this is a trap, Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles go through White Acropolis, which kind of gives me Shadow Moses vibes. I mean, it kind of makes sense. After all, both Snake and Eggman share the same voice actor in Japan. Hello, me, from the future! Or, at least, at the time of this recording in this particular video file, it is currently June 14th. Which means E3 is currently going on right now, and I've been keeping track with the news, but I'll share my thoughts later. But, I just wanted to correct myself here in saying that no, both Snake and Eggman aren't shared by the same voice actor, but I kind of had some details mixed up. What I meant to say is that it would make sense because Dr. Eggman's Japanese voice actor is Chikao Atsuka, and his son, Akio Atsuka, is the Japanese voice actor for Solid Snake. I'm not making this up. I've corrected myself. I've double-checked. Anyway, now that I've corrected myself, let's get back to the video, shall we? But honestly, this is one of my favorite levels in terms of concept and theming. The Arctic base motif is cool, 
no pun intended, and the music is just a bop. Now, one thing you'll see here are the boarding sections. Notice how I didn't say snowboarding. Yep, Sonic is on a board more than once, but let's talk about the controls. The board controls are just stiff. Now, in most games dealing with a fancy piece of plywood and fiberglass, you're usually going forward, and you do a gradual turn while going forward. Even in Sonic Adventure, when you're boarding down Ice Cap, the board moves on its own. And when you hold left or right, it just steers into those directions, but you still go forward. Even in Sonic Adventure 2, in the beginning of City Escape, Sonic is boarding down the hills of San Francisco, and the controls were smooth. Yet, in Sonic 2006, wherever you hold the stick, the board immediately points towards it. It's like the board is coated in butter and it slips and slides. Now, when you hold forward, you go forward. That makes sense. But when you let go, Sonic stops. That is not how boards work! Also, grinding is either hit or miss. And when the camera shifts to you, warning away from an avalanche, you need to hold the opposite direction in order to keep your momentum. And if you don't have enough speed when you jump off this ramp, you could fall into the cold abyss below. But after you get past this, we control tails in this little section, avoiding spotlights and hitting switches. And then you go back to playing as Sonic in this big open area, where we need to navigate our way to the goal ring by finding ways past laser walls and hordes of robotic enemies to get to the goal ring and clear the stage. Okay, so I know I was joking about Shadow Moses Island earlier, but this really does feel more like a Metal Gear game. <laughs> Take this! That's impossible! Even you will blast on against this one! No! The controls won't respond! Your manners are as bad as ever! Now look what you've done! Bombs away! After we get through White Acropolis, Eggman tells Sonic to place the Chaos Emerald in the middle of the room. He does so, but since this is a trap, Eggman triggers it, and soon Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles are caught in an energy field, and claims that with the power Princess Elise possesses and the seven Chaos Emeralds, Eggman would become the Master of Time. Testing the machine, he launches Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles off into the future, where we instantly see how much it sucks. The world is on fire and engulfed in magma, everyone's dead, the only beings alive are a few Mobians like Silver and Blaze, but worst of all, Chow in Space 3 is cancelled! What kind of future is this? Okay, I'm calm, I am okay. Anyway, we somehow find Shadow and Rouge here. How they got here will be explained later as well. But to put it simply, we all have the same goal. Find a Chaos Emerald, use Chaos Control to create a rift in space-time and go back to the present. Now, we have to get through Crisis City. This... is one of my favorite levels. Sure, it's not the most polished, but it's such a fun level. Also, listen to that music. So good! Boarding down broken buildings, doing sick jumps over pits of magma, and running from a fire tornado! Despite being a city on fire, this is actually one of Sonic 2006's best levels. Which is why when Generations came out, 
This was one of the levels in the lineup for the modern generation. Sure, they could have just picked Crisis City because they needed a fire level, but if you ask me, Crisis City is one of Sonic 2006's best levels. After exploring a bit, Sonic finds Silver and Blaze talking to someone who looks like a recolored shadow. Original OC, do not steal. He's claiming to save the world that they must hunt the Iblis Trigger and kill them. Silver is tricked into thinking Sonic is said Trigger, which we all know is false. After teleporting away, Tails looks at the records and reveals that Elise died two days after the Festival of the Sun when Eggman's battleship exploded. They realize that this has something to do with the Flames of Disaster, so now they need to find a way to make it back in time to save Elise and possibly prevent this future. Save the princess. Save the world. Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles catch up with Shadow and Rouge, who have already found a Chaos Emerald. I may not look it, but I'm a real treasure hunter. Unlike a certain Echidna I know. What? Ooh, touchy. Then we have to go through- OH MY GOD, THIS ABOMINATION! Flame Core. This level alone is the bane of my existence. I mean, don't get me wrong, concept-wise it's a cool level, and there's some parts of the level that are kind of fun, but if Crisis City is one of the best levels, then Flame Core is the worst. Okay, second worst, but it's still pretty bad. It's like the difficulty was set to 5 at the beginning, but as you get into the level, the dial quickly gets cranked up to 20. I like the music at least, especially with Knuckles in this dark cave. The whole level is just infuriating. The combat arenas, which aren't that bad, but the pillars of fire makes this a pain in the robotics. And not only that, since there's an erupting volcano, there's fireballs raining down, and you will always get hit no matter what! Also, the platforms move way too fast. Flame Core. Easily one of the worst levels in Sonic 2006. So, after we get through that headache of a level... Eh. We see a Chaos Emerald! Don't touch it! Don't touch it! Don't touch it! Don't touch it! My, 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 my goodness, what is that thing? Apparently, that's Iblis, but in some sort of larval stage. Well, if we want that Chaos Emerald, we have to fight him. Okay, I'll be a little bit more detailed than that. Larval Iblis is pretty easy. It's just a matter of jumping from platform to platform, biding your time and dodging his attacks, and Iblis trying to dive bomb you. Now, in order to damage him, you need to lure Iblis in by hitting these glowy orbs. This fight is all about paying attention, biding your time, and dodging his attacks. You do that, and the fight is done in no time flat. So, after we defeat Iblis, for now, Sonic and Shadow take out the emeralds they've collected, and they both perform Chaos Control, forming a rift in space-time. And Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles jump in, making it back to the present. Sonic then grabs a newspaper from the ground, revealing that Elise has been kidnapped, and that tomorrow is the day she dies. Sonic now has to get through Radical Train, and it's time to cue the funkiest track to accompany a Sonic game. This theme kicks so much ass. Plus, this is my second favorite level in the entire game. 
running through a train yard, making sure trains don't blow up because Eggman rigged the tracks with explosives. Like, seriously, Eggman? The heck? And all set to city funk music. Now, the only thing that really sours this level is the mock speed running section, where it's like you have to do an extreme version of jump rope by jumping over these trains, except replace the jump rope with razor wire. Yeah, yeah, the jump will lose your legs. Not to mention, when you chase the train Eggman is in, parts of the train will blow up, and the debris will hit Sonic 95% of the time. So the first part of the level is good, but the second part is just meh. Overall, it gets a B. Anyway, after catching the train and managing to rescue Elise, Sonic runs into Silver again, who's still trying to kill him. At least he's consistent. But while they're busy, Eggman captures Elise again and flies off. But Shadow intervenes, allowing Sonic to get away, leaving Shadow to fight with Silver. Elise pulls a gutsy move by jumping off Eggman's Eggmobile from high up. Luckily, Sonic manages to catch her in time. We then proceed to fight Egg Genesis, which is a missed opportunity to make it black and red like the Sega Genesis. But missed opportunities aside, this boss is pretty cool, because you have to climb up using the homie attack, attacking the head, and bouncing on it to damage it. Repeat the process, and you'll win in no time. However, the missiles do get a tad bothersome, but I find spin dashing actually helps with this fight, and after you defeat it, it tries to crash into you. But by the time it actually crashes, Sonic is on the other side of the map. Afterwards, Sonic picks up Elise and they proceed to ditch the robots in... 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 Ah, oh, shoot, what's the name of the level? Tropical Jungle? Oh, come on! What is with these generic sounding names all of a sudden? Which is a freaking shame because this level is actually really well done. It has the right amount of speed, the music is well done, and it's got springs! Plus, I like how the vines glow when you reach the highest point of the swing. It really helps you time your jumps just right. The only weird thing here is that Sonic is carrying Elise again. And you know what that means. Yep, the shield mechanic from Dusty Desert is used in the second part of the stage. However, instead of sand, you're walking on water. But again, it's a shame that such a neat level has a generic sounding name. I mean, they could have picked a better name like Jungle Speedway or Tropical Escape. Heck, I'll even take Wild Canopy. After getting through the jungle, we are then treated to another cutscene. Elise is a little too clingy here. It sounds like being a princess isn't that easy. It isn't sometimes, but I love this country. Everyone in the castle, the children, all my citizens, really. The same love my late father and mother had. I feel that like a Disney princess, she could break into song at any moment. But the piece is abrupted by Eggman. Whoa, 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 whoa. Is that the freaking egg carrier? It is. But it's more futuristic looking. Which I feel looks more like something out of Gundam than Eggman's usual architecture. And I honestly prefer the Sonic Adventure design. It looks more like an airship compared to this design where it makes me think of an off-brand action figure. Now, I did skip over a small section where we play as Tails and Wave Ocean, because he's chasing after Elise, who went to see Eggman on the Egg Carrier. But really, it's just Sonic's section of Wave Ocean again, so we're not really missing much. But the only thing I will say about this is that you can really see just how encumbered Tails is with his moveset. But you can usually just fly past most of the enemies anyway, so it's not a big deal. But still. Tails' attack just being him throwing dummy rings is just bad. Hashtag bring back the Tails attack. Sonic rushes to save Elise, but oh no, robots! Wait, what? They stopped? <gasps> oh hey, it's Silver again! 
But this time, he doesn't want to kill us! Circumstances have changed. I need to rescue the princess. Now, Sonic and Silver have to go through Kingdom Valley in order to get to Elise and die. This is another level that I love, but it's also one of the stages that was shown off in the E3 trailer and demo. But the idea for the stage is just brilliant. Let Sonic run through a dilapidated castle with robots chasing after you, grinding on air currents, using the lightspeed dash to reach higher areas, and once again, the freaking music! I love the instrumentation throughout this level. The stringed instruments making things sound like the Middle Ages, while the wind instruments tie in with the fact that this place has been abandoned and nature has reclaimed it. The drums make you feel tense, and when you play a silver for the first time, synths start to play to reflect that he's from the future, and he's fighting to change it for the better as well as him using his psychic powers to affect the environment around him for platforming purposes. It's very clever! Again, we deal with the mock speed running section of this level, but surprisingly, it's not that problematic like the other ones. And you have to admit, seeing Sonic run through here is just epic. But alas, we make it through. But the controls crash, systems fail, and the egg carrier crashes, killing Eggman and Elise. Elise! Sonic mourns over the loss of his friend, and all hope seems lost. Until Silver has an idea. Use the Chaos Emerald to create a rift in space-time using Chaos Control, and go back to an earlier point in time to save Elise. Wait... Wasn't that the plan originally? Okay, so Silver pulls out a Chaos Emerald, as does Sonic, they both perform Chaos Control, and Sonic jumps into the rift. And we now find ourselves at an earlier point in time before the Egg Carrier launches. So now, we have to find out where the Egg Carrier is hidden. Before it's too late. <laughs> Before I move on with the rest of Sonic's story, I want to bring up something which you have not been seeing throughout this video so far. The Hub World. The Hub World of Soliana is really neat to look at, but it is easily the least interesting thing about Sonic 2006, which is a shame because Soliana is based on Venice, Italy, one of the most unique places in the world. Plus, unlike the rest of the game, the Hub World hasn't aged all that well. There are side quests, Soliana medals, which take the place of emblems, scattered around said hub world, and a lot of NPCs. Some of them are interesting, like Sonic Man, for example, but some of the missions are super boring. I like side quests. Heck, the ones in Sonic Adventure were kind of neat and fun to play, but the ones in Sonic 2006 aren't very well done. The worst thing about them is that unlike an adventure, they were an optional side mode, and didn't require you to do them in order to move the story. In Sonic 2006 though, some of them are mandatory. You can't access the stages until you fulfill a certain side quest. Heck, they're not even side quests at this point. In fact, me bringing up Sonic Adventure earlier is exactly what the hub world is trying to imitate. Soliana is just the hub world from Sonic Adventure all over again. Oh, don't believe me? Well, let's compare then, shall we? Sonic Adventure had three hub worlds. Station Square, the Mystic Ruins, and the Egg Carrier. 
Sonic 2006, while it takes place in Soliana, but you have the Castle Town, New City, and Soliana Forest. Both games have three hub worlds that you can access stages, find emblems, and do side quests. However, despite these similarities, I feel the hub world in Sonic 2006 was poorly handled. Sonic Adventure's hub world was fun to navigate because you'd be able to find upgrades for the characters, as well as rings, extra lives, and emblems. It made wanting to explore the hub world fun to do. However, not many people liked the hub world and adventure at the time, hence why Sonic Adventure 2 didn't have hub worlds. Except the Child Garden, but that's different. However, Sonic 2006's hub world is big, yes, but they're too big. Castletown feels more lived in than New City. I get wanting to showcase the power of these next generation consoles at the time, but it would have been better if they shrank down the size of the hub world, or if they wanted to make it big, at least add stuff that allows us to explore every nook and cranny. Like, let me explore every inch of New City to find secrets. That way I feel rewarded for exploring the city, and I had fun doing it. Also, you know in Sonic Adventure, when you go into the stages, they were a part of the world? Like, to get to Emerald Coast, you just go down to the beach, or if you wanted to go to Casinoopolis, you just enter the casino. Or, if you wanted to get to Speed Highway, you enter this building? Well, not here! In Sonic 2006, you access the stages with these gateways called The Mirror of Soliana. These are neat in concept, but they come off as a lazy way to get to the stages. I mean, the first one you come across, Wave Ocean, is positioned in front of a cove. Why not just run through the cove? Why do I need to use a magical mirror to get to the beach? Some of them are a little better, like the Tropical Jungle and the Kingdom Valley ones, because they come off as magical gateways with the way they're presented. Unlike Radical Train, which is just in a train station. Can you imagine how silly that sounds? Is the train still here? Do you have a ticket? Here's my ticket. Everything looks in order. All right, make sure you jump into the mirror of Soliana and just go to platform nine and three quarters. Thank you. He just wanted to get on a train. As much as I like Hub Worlds, I can already tell you that this game would have been a lot better if the Hub World didn't exist, and just transitioned from one level to the next, like Sonic Adventure 2. Also, the funny thing is that Crisis City, the best stage, and Flame Core, the second worst stage, are the only stages in the game that don't have Mirrors of Soliana. I mean, unless you were to hack the game, but that doesn't really count. Okay, getting back to the story, we eventually find out Eggman is keeping the egg carrier in a secret laboratory under Soliana. We do what we need to do to get access to it, and we go into the final stage of Sonic's story, Aquatic Base. So, remember earlier when I said Flame Core is the second worst stage? Well, meet the first! Concept-wise, I like it. An underwater laboratory? That's like... peak aesthetic. Also, the music is super chill. Maybe a little too chill. I get Toonami vibes from this. Which isn't bad, mind you, but for a Sonic game, it's a little too calm. I mean, this is the final stage for Sonic. Wouldn't it have been better if the music was... 
Oh, I don't know. More epic. The biggest problem with the stage is one word. Lasers. There are too many lasers in the first part of the stage. You got laser gates, laser walls, laser attacks, laser discs. There's just so many lasers. Thought that was fun. How about we throw in this one section where you walk on a giant metal bubble across a bottomless pit, and if the bubble hits a laser gate, it pops, and you fall into the dark abyss below. Okay, honestly, it's not that bad, but it doesn't help that enemy attacks will also pop the bubble, so you have to keep moving. But if you move too fast, the bubble will bounce all over the place. Not to mention, you have these rooms where you fight hordes of robots and you can't leave until you beat them all. Tails and Knuckles make a return, and as you can clearly see, Tails just can't handle all these enemies with his moveset. I've already mentioned how encumbered he is, but it really shows in this particular level. Knuckles, though, I have no complaint. In fact, I'm honestly surprised how well he handles here. At least when we get to the second part of the stage, the music ramps up and is more fitting of a final stage, but overall, Aquatic Base is just poorly executed. Final egg, this is not. Okay, so Sonic manages to board the egg carrier before it takes off, and this time, Sonic is here when the controls start to fail. Eggman is a little peeved because he thinks Sonic is the one who messed up the controls, which leads us into the final boss, the Egg Wyvern. It's kind of like the Egg Viper boss from Sonic Adventure mixed with the Egg Cerberus. The only thing that's missing is... Get a load of this! 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 But the Egg Wyvern is a good boss, and totally makes up for the disappointment that is Aquatic Base. He will fly around and attack from afar, dodge the blasts, and he'll begin to charge at you. But you do a homing attack on the Egg Wyvern as it comes towards you, and now Sonic is riding the Wyvern just like he did with the doggy. But you have to make it crash into the falling debris to damage it. Eventually, the shielding around the cockpit will be destroyed, and Eggman will do the exact same thing he did with the Egg Viper, where you need to use the homing attack to climb your way up to the cockpit. Eventually, Eggman is defeated. I can't believe this! Yeah! Sonic carries the leads while running at full force and pulling off some sick jumping skills and... <gasps> oh no! Sonic and Lee are gonna fall into the ocean! That's okay, cause they get propelled by an explosion and they land safely in the meadow on top of the cliff. They both laugh about it and... Nice smile! <laughs> okay, that was really cheesy. <laughs> and this is a little too romantic sounding. And that was Sonic Story. Now, let's move on to Shadow Story! Also, I realize how long this video is, so I'm going to be skipping over some parts just to save on time. Also, there's not that much that we have already seen, considering that some parts interweave with other parts, so... Eh, we're not missing much. Shadow starts all hardcore and edgy, like the early 2000s emo kid he truly is. Plus, I'm getting Metal Gear vibes again. So apparently, after the events of Shadow the Hedgehog, <laughs> and yes, I'll also be talking about this mess at some point as well. <clears throat> anyway, Shadow is apparently working for Gun as an agent, and he was sent in to rescue Rouge from Eggman's base, which means White Acropolis is our first level. Shadow can do some of the same things as Sonic, like the homing attack, for example. But if you keep pushing the A button, Shadow will do a bunch of inner fight moves making him look like he's doing his best Dragon Ball fight scene impression. But it can be a little bit annoying when you want Shadow to go forward, but he has to finish his in-air flash dancing before he can move. Also, like in Shadow the Hedgehog, Shadow can drive various vehicles, like this Jeep. Also, before you ask, no, there are no guns in this game, other than the ones equipped on the vehicles, but that's nothing to worry about. Also, Rouge plays like a weird mix of Knuckles and Tails. She can glide and climb walls, well, like Knuckles, but she throws 
bombs at enemies like tails throwing dummy rings. But honestly, Rouge's bombs are way better. Eventually, they both meet up, and Rouge apparently stole this item from Eggman, and she needs to meet up with Gun. But before they can escape, we get to see the Egg Cerberus again! It's basically the same fight, only now we're in a snowy arctic base instead of a desert temple. After giving the doggy a cold concussion, Shadow and Rouge exit out of a teleporter, and we now find ourselves in Soliana. Ah, Soliana, the city of water. It has a constitutional monarchy, you know. The primary industries are tourism and crafting precision machinery. The current sovereign is Princess Elise the Third. I kind of like this scene because Rouge talks about Soliana as a country. Its government, who's in charge, what their industry focuses on, etc, etc. I just like this little touch of world building. It flushes out the game world in a neat way. Rouge then asks Shadow if he can escort her to the Gun Rendezvous Point, located in Kingdom Valley. It's more Kingdom Valley, and that's a good thing. But the only notable thing is that we start off with Shadow using a jet glider, and then he eventually uses a hovercraft to navigate through the stage. The vehicles themselves are a little much, but after you get off them, you play Kingdom Valley like normal. It's a lot of fun just playing this level with Shadow and Rouge, and I just enjoyed my time here. Eventually, we find ourselves in an old castle. While they're there, Rouge fills us in on why said castle was abandoned. So, remember back when Elise explained that the Flames of Disaster are Solaris's judgment? Well, the reason Solaris was angry was because the king was trying to create an alternative form of energy. Then an accident happened, and the project was called... The Solaris Project. It was an ambitious project, named after their eternal sun god. As Shadow dodges and Rouge tries to fly away, Eggman sucker punches Rouge with his Eggmobile, and Shadow, being the gentleman that he is, rescues Rouge, and the scepter breaks as it hits the ground. Suddenly, all the robots start to glitch, and Eggman freaks out and bails. Then, the shadowy bean absorbs Shadow Shadow? Yeah, that makes, sense. that makes sense. Oh, hey! It's recolored Shadow from earlier! Apparently, his name is Mephilus. Mephilus the Dark. Well, there goes that idea. And weirdly enough, he somehow knows Shadow and says he's gonna give him and Rouge a one way ticket to oblivion which is apparently just the bad future Silver came from. And this explains how Shadron Rouge got here. Well, we already know the plan. Find a Chaos Emerald, create a rift in space-time, and go back to the present. But you know how when Sonic starts Crisis City, he's boarding down the side of a broken building? Well, Shadow starts with a Jeep. This is just silly. Shadow is better off without the Jeep in this section, so I just jump out of it, and do the opening section on foot. It's way better, and it's just more Crisis City. And that's a good thing. We then find a Chaos Emerald, but we see Omega just lying amongst the debris. Shadow opens up his back panel to see what's wrong with him, only to find out he's in standby mode. I'm just amazed how he was able to still be in one piece in this hexscape. We eventually meet up with Sonic Tails and Knuckles. Aha! I got you! You thought I was gonna do that silly and Knuckles bit again. But uh, I gotta keep you on your toes. Gotta keep you paying attention. <laughs> so anyway, we go through Flame Core again. And it's a little better with Shadow, but it's still the worst level. We also beat up Iblis again. I win. And we get to see what happened after Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles jumped into the portal. Rouge jumps in, but Shadow stays behind and chases after Mephilus. 
But as soon as Rouge gets back to the present, she notices that Shadow isn't with her. So she immediately formulates a plan and begins searching for Omega in Tropical Jungle. I think it's really cool that this stage is exclusively for Rouge. It really brings back some Dry Lagoon memories. But again, another decent level. And it is one of the easiest when playing as Rouge, because you could just glide to the end faster than it takes to heat up a pack of white castles in the microwave. Also, there's this bit in the music where at one point we hear this ominous tune. Which is actually the same melody used in Crisis City, implying the sole reason for finding Omega, to rescue Shadow from the future. It's a very clever use of leitmotif, and I like it a lot. Eventually, she finds Omega. Nice to know that the walking arsenal has a softer side. So Rouge briefs Omega on the situation going on, and asks him to deliver a Chaos Emerald to Shadow in the future. Omega accepts this mission. System reactivation countdown initiated. Backup power source. Spare magazines secured. Command program priority changed. New mission, shadow support. External access no longer permitted. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Omega's solution to help shadow in the future is to wait. Who's clapping? This explains why we saw Omega in the streets of Crisis City. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is an example of the bootstrap paradox. And I love it. Meanwhile, Shadow catches up to Mephiles and demands answers on who he is and if he is the one who caused this future. The answer is yes and no. And then goes on to explain that after the world was engulfed in Iblis's flames, AKA the Flames of Disaster, humanity went on a manhunt to figure out who brought about the destruction of the world, and ultimately made Shadow into a scapegoat to hunt him down and lock him away in a vault. Mephilus then tries to pull the Villain 101 tactic of offering Shadow a chance to join him and get his revenge on humanity for falsely accusing him and locking him up. However, Shadow refuses, because he knows better than that. Obviously not super pleased with his answer, Mephilus reveals his true form. A crystallized version of Shadow. Wait! So, if his true body is made of crystals, and his name is Mephilus... Does that mean he's crystal meth? <laughs> we then proceed to fight Mephilus. And his fight is kind of fun, but it's also a tad annoying. He makes these little minion things, and they all try to attack you, and in order for you to deal damage to him, you have to hit Mephilus 
while powered up. But his boss music is pretty epic. It's a wonderfully weird mix of horror and EDM. It's a ghoulish rave. Grave? It perfectly encapsulates what Mephilus is. A mysterious being with a murderous aura. While not being a violent being, he has no fear in showing his power. Truly, a walking nightmare. Eventually, Omega shows up and makes his boss fight go from mildly challenging to easy. Because Omega has shotgun arms. He could just simply mow down all these mini Mephiluses. Mephiluses? Mephili? Anyway, we defeat Mephilus and he escapes through a portal. Then Shadow and Omega chase after him. And now they're back in the present. They both try to find Mephilus and they eventually meet up with Rouge. And she explains that Eggman's robots are looking for Shadow. When in actuality, they're looking for Mephilus wearing his recolor Shadow disguise. Thinking Eggman might have the answers, Shadow decides to look for Eggman in Radical Train. Again, it's more of the same in Radical Train, but this time we need to stop the train Eggman is on, so we turn on the barriers this time. We also need to beat up the train, and while the fact that Shadow can simply punch a train and damage it is already impressive by itself, but it will never top the feat in Final Fantasy VI where Sabin suplexes a train. What a chat. And we then chase down Eggman's train using a motorcycle. It's cool, but easily one of the more annoying elements. See, the motorcycle has some weird physics. When you bump into a wall, it ricochets off into the opposite direction, forcing you to reverse and get back on track. All while the train you need to stop is still moving towards the goal. And if Eggman makes it through the tunnel at the end, you fail, and you have to start all over again. You see, what you have to do is shoot down the train's cargo and the wheels on the side of the train. The cargo is easy to shoot because it's big, but the wheels are hard to hit. And it doesn't help when I try to correct myself to get a better shot, I then hit a wall and I'm sent flying backwards. I mean, it's nothing you can't get used to, but you can get annoyed with this real quick. So after we stop the train, Shadow bursts in and demands answers. Wouldn't the door have been easier? However, Eggman is being intentionally vague and only gives Shadow a hint as to who Mephilus is, saying that it's connected to the accident that happened 10 years ago with the Solaris Project. And Eggman has the gall to tell Shadow to bring Mephilus to him, basically trying to play on Shadow's curiosity for his own gain. But again, Shadow knows better. Eventually, we come back to this cutscene of Shadow intervening and facing off against Silver. We now have to fight Silver! So, you know how the last time we fought him, we were in that big open area where we can easily dodge Silver's attacks and keep him at a distance? Well, say goodbye to that and say hello to tight spaces, moving trains, pillars, and an over-enthusiastic telekinetic hedgehog chasing after you. It's legit scary! I mean, you can still keep your distance, but if he manages to grab you, you better hope he throws you far away, because if he throws you up into the air or into a wall before you can pick up a ring and get away in time, you're pretty much screwed. However, if you manage to keep your distance, not try to hit him more than once, and wait till he leaves himself open, you can easily defeat him. Afterwards, Silver tries to hit him. But Shadow uses Chaos Control to slow time and give him a roundhouse kick to the back of the head. Don't bother. With the Chaos Emerald's power, I control time and space. You can't break free. I won't give up. It all depends on me. Can't lose. Not when I'm so close. Silver, pumping himself up like the shonen protagonist he is, decides to fight fire with fire and use chaos control at the same time as Shadow, which creates a rift like before. Silver then goes on to say he won't give up on changing the past to save his future. And after hearing that, it all makes sense to Shadow. Mephilus isn't trying to help you create a better future. He's trying to eliminate the past.
Of course, Silver is a little dumbfounded by this, only for Shadow to say that if he wants to learn the truth, to follow him into the rift to see what happened 10 years ago. Which, of course, Silver follows. Now, here is what happened 10 years ago. It turns out the Solaris Project was all about harnessing Solaris itself as a power source for time travel. However, Solaris was writhing in anger and pain. Why, Solaris? Why do you refuse to listen to my voice? Then Elise runs in, for Elise. reasons, and before the container blows up, he dies to shield Elise from- Shadow and Silver rush in and check to see if anyone survived. Is Only to see the origins of Iblis and Mephilis. Flame, it's Iblis! And the Black Shadow is the original Mephilis. That's Mephilis? Yes! As it turns out, Iblis and Mephilis were originally Solaris at one point, but split up into two separate beings due to the blast, and they both run away. Shadow and Silver split up to make sure they don't escape, but Shadow is halted by the King who's barely holding on, and hands Shadow the Scepter of Darkness. Which sounds like a weapon from Dark Souls. To presumably seal Mephilus. Shadow accepts, and they both chase after Iblis and Mephilus in aquatic base. Now, with Shadow, it's actually a lot more fun. Because this time, Shadow doesn't use a vehicle in the beginning section. I mean, you could get on a motorcycle, but I chose not to and I had a lot more fun attacking enemies and clearing rooms. Honestly, I think this is one of Shadow's best stages. His in-air fighting is perfect for clearing enemies with more health, and the one area where you do use a motorcycle is actually a lot of fun to mow down these monsters with a machine gun while barreling down a hallway. So despite the fact that Aquatic Base sucks for Sonic, it's actually one of Shadow's better stages. Weird how that works out. We then get to see Shadow sealing Mephilus in the Scepter of Darkness. Who... Who are... You? I'm Shadow. Shadow the Hedgehog. Shadow. Your face. Your form. I remember. And we see another example of the Bootstrap Paradox. Since it was Shadow who originally sealed Mephilus, and 10 years later, when he was released back in Kingdom Valley, Mephilus knew who Shadow was. Anyway, Mephilus is now properly sealed. Silver puts Elise, who is unconscious, next to a tree, and Shadow leaves the scepter behind. You're going to leave it behind? Yes, I already know what becomes of it in the future. So, Shadow and Silver create a rift to go back to the present. And Shadow jumps in. We're now back at the present. Rouge tells us that Omega is currently hunting down Mephilus. Shadow then asks Rouge to find out what materials the Scepter of Darkness was made from. Cause now he knows how to seal Mephilus. Okay, now, I normally wouldn't include one of these side quests because most times it's usually fight a bunch of robots or monsters without dying, which isn't an issue and it's not that hard to complete. But this leads to Shadow getting a new Scepter of Darkness. Just find a statue, light four torches with Chaos Beer, and there it is. It's kind of like a really simple puzzle you find in a Zelda game. It's just funny to me and I don't know why. We now head to Wave Ocean, where you fly a jet glider, control Omega for a moment, and switch back to Shadow in a section of Wave Ocean that's exclusive to Shadow. And then we make it to the goal on a hovercraft. We then see Omega gunning down Mephilus, only for Mephilus to try and get into his head, stating that it was him who defeated Shadow and sealed him in the future. This does make Omega hesitate, but only for a second because he then gets super mad and switches from shotgun arms to gatling gun arms and guns him down only for Mephilus to laugh maniacally and dissipate. <laughs> and here is where it gets kind of deep. Omega then tells Shadow what Mephilus told him, 
that it was Omega who defeated Shadow and sealed him away. Shadow doesn't really know what to make of this. Rouge then asks why, and Omega puts it pretty well. Eventually, when something or someone is seen as too powerful, it is seen as a threat. And then the world becomes its enemy. Shadow? Even if you believe everyone in the world will be against you, know that I'll always remain by your side. Remember that. I will. Eesh, that got real. Let's, uh... Let's wrap up Shadow's story. Y yeah, yeah, let's do that. We eventually track down Mephilus to Dusty Desert. Why? Because he's apparently going after a Chaos Emerald in the vicinity. Supposedly, he needs one in order to join with Iblis again. So, we start the stage and... Uh, okay, fine. One last vehicle section. I guess Sonic Team must have really liked seeing Shadow in vehicles so much that they made it a part of his gameplay. Okay, that is kind of cute, but that doesn't always make for good gameplay. And this beginning section kind of had me floating around the entire map till I died, and then afterwards I tried hitting the question ring. Because apparently, what I needed to do was go through these pillars that pop out of the sand in order to get to Mephilus. Afterwards, we get this brief section exclusive to Shadow, and then we switch over to Omega and play an extensively large section of the level as Omega. I mean, there's more Omega in the final level than Shadow. Not that I'm complaining. But for a final level, you think there'd be more Shadow gameplay? Well, anyway, we reach the end and we confront Mephilus, who has claimed the Yellow Chaos Emerald. However, he once again tries to persuade Shadow to join him and teach the world a lesson. Only for Shadow to call him out on his bullshit, and then Mephilus turns the floor into Purple Flurp. We now have our final showdown. Mephilus is invulnerable at the moment, but the moment he dives into the floor, out pops three giant golems made of darkness. But you need to hit the ones that attack, and when you do, you can beat the crap out of them and build up Shadow's meter. One thing I kind of forgot to mention is that the three hedgehogs in this game have special abilities you can access once this action gauge is filled up. When the action gauge is filled up and you press the right trigger, you activate Shadow's Chaos Boost, which makes Shadow's attacks much stronger. I talk about what Sonic had, but I'm gonna save that for later. But what does happen is that after you get full Chaos Boost, the floor returns to normal, forcing Mephilus to reveal himself. And now, you can hit him. And the rest of the fight is over real quick, because you can wail on him with Shadow's in-air fighting moves. And after we defeat Mephilus, Mephilus starts to melt, and revert back to his goopy Shadow form. Shadow tries to seal Mephilus in the Scepter of Darkness again. But wait, something's up. The scepter! It's destroyed! Apparently, when Mephilus absorbed Shadow's shadow, he not only took on his form, but also gained his abilities. So, to put it simply, What may have worked ten years ago no longer does. A now fully reinvigorated Mephilus now has not only the yellow Chaos Emerald, but Shadow's green Chaos Emerald as well. And he then summons an army of Mephiluses. Mephili? I don't know. And he then questions Shadow on why he chooses to continue to fight for humanity, even though humanity will eventually betray him. If the world chooses to become my enemy, I will fight like I always have. He then attacks the Horde, and then credits. 
Woo! All right, we are on a roll. Now, let's move on to Silver Story. This world was devastated before I was born. A harsh, bleak place where we live in eternal darkness. Life is a struggle, and people live without hope. How did this happen? No one will answer me directly. But they always point to the flames. I don't know why, but I feel like I'm listening to a teenager's first draft of a fanfic. Anyway, he wants to know why the world is like this. Blaze then appears, telling Silver that Iblis has appeared again. He then rockets forth using his telekinetic powers, and Blaze then follows after him. We go through Crisis City as the first stage, and we're taught about Silver's powers. He can run, but he's not fast like Sonic and Shadow. So, in other words, he runs at normal speed. However, he can levitate. That's because he's telekinetic, meaning he can levitate, pick up things, and manipulate various objects using the power of his mind. When this guy came out, I thought he was so cool. He looks cool, aside from the boots, which I could take or leave, but his playstyle is really unique. Picking up various objects or enemies and hurling them at another enemy or switch you can't quite reach just feels so satisfying. He can also use his powers on special pads, and something might happen, like rebuilding a bridge or making certain objects levitate so he can get across a white gap, or bending a steel beam so that when you let go, it flings you into the air, which you can then levitate to a nearby platform. If there was just going to be a game which featured Silver as the main character, I would totally play that game. But since I'm talking about Silver's powers, let me talk about the physics of this game. This game uses the Havoc physics engine, which came out in the year 2000. And since then, it's been used in over 600 video games, all the way up to 2020 with Animal Crossing New Horizons. But this game from 2006 has a few issues with it, which you can see in Tails Dummy Rings or just the rings you try to pick up if you get hit. See, with previous Sonic games, when you get hit, it's not hard to pick up all your rings again. But in Sonic 2006, the rings that get knocked out of you will get pushed away like if it was a dummy ring before eventually being able to pick them up again. This is because both the real rings and the dummy rings use the same physics. When they float in the air and spin around, you can pick them up like normal. But when you get hit, they behave like dummy rings for a second before the game is like, Oh, hey, you actually want to pick these ones up. My bad, here you go. While that is annoying, you can get used to it, but it's a little wonky. Now, the physics for other items, sometimes they work like normal. Other times they fly off at high speed. Take this section of Crisis City. Silver states, I can wipe them out if I hit that pipe. Now, obviously, we're meant to throw a box at the pipe and the pipe rolls down the building and crushes the enemies. Of course, this is what happens when you try to do that. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that's supposed to happen. So, getting back to the game, Crisis City is a really fun stage that has more of a focus on platforming than speed. And later, when we switch over to Blaze in one section, she plays just like Sonic, which is kind of fitting considering that her debut game, Sonic Rush, came out a year earlier than Sonic 2006. Okay, before I continue on with the story and the gameplay, can we talk about Blaze's inclusion in this game? I mean, in Sonic Rush, where she was first introduced, Blaze is a princess from another dimension. However, here, both Blaze and Silver have been fighting alongside each other against Iblis in the future. So, what's the deal? Well, apparently, Blaze's appearance in Sonic Rush is canon, and how she got to Silver's future is left to unknown circumstances, or so they would have you believe. Because fun fact, the reason Blaze ended up in Sonic's dimension in Sonic Rush was to stop a threat to both Sonic's world and Blaze's world. And she was brought there by the power of the Soul Emeralds, 
and they can warp time and space, just like the Chaos Emerald. So, what happened here is that Blaze was brought to Sonic's world into the future to help Silver, because something was wrong with the timeline. So, with that out of the way, let's get back to the story. Which, like Sonic and Shadow, you just need to complete a certain objective and get to the goal ring. After getting through Crisis City, we then find Iblis looking... incomplete. The boss fight here is really cool. You basically have to fling objects he throws at you back at him. It's kind of fun to do. But there's some cool stuff about this fight. You basically have to throw rocks and his own fireballs back at his head. And this whole fight is basically just trying to break off his rocky armor. And there's a point where Iblis will pick up entire buildings and try to slam them down on top of you to damage you. But eventually, when you break off his armor, he'll look like if Orgo was made of lava, had a set of extra arms, and has a chin like Thanos. And after defeating him, Blaze congratulates Silver, but Silver, being the moody teen that he is, points out that it's hopeless. Iblis will just keep reforming, and the cycle never ends. He wants to destroy Iblis for good, but doesn't know how to do so. Then Mephilus shows up in his recolored shadow disguise, claiming that like a flower coming from a seed, or a chicken comes from an egg. Everything has an origin, including Iblis. Silver asks if he knows how this happened. Mephilus then creepily stares at the screen before we are shown the next cutscene. He explains that Iblis was summoned by someone called the Iblis Trigger, who, as you can guess by the name, triggered Iblis to destroy the world. He then gives Silver a purple Chaos Emerald, which shows Sonic surrounded in flames, making Silver believe Sonic is the Iblis Trigger. Of course, Blaze seems a little wary of this. Hedgehog. We then get transported back in time and Silver is in sheer awe. This is so unbelievable. Everything's not on fire! That's amazing! Now, I must fight for the future. Look at this boy. Look at this plant-loving nerd. I love him, and he needs to be protected. So, we eventually figure out we need to go to Tropical Jungle. And hey, this is the same section Rouge went through. Although since we can't just glide to the end, we have to focus on platforming and making our way through the ruins which is a lot of fun, and is again, a good level for Silver. Although, I will admit, it was a little confusing to navigate through here, but once I got high up, I could make my way through and beat the level. Meanwhile, Blaze ended up in Wave Ocean, and this stage is all about her, which is nice, and allows me to explain her playstyle. She basically plays like Sonic. She can run fast and do her own take on the homing attack, but unlike Sonic, she can double jump. And her take on the homing attack is a little tricky at first, but once you learn how it works, it's pretty darn effective. This just makes me want a 3D Sonic Rush game. But getting back on topic, we then see Silver watching Sonic like before. He then tries to make his move, but then all of a sudden, Amy shows up! Of course, she does the same thing when she met Shadow in Sonic Adventure 2 mistaking Silver for Sonic. Amy, sweetie, I love you, but you probably need to get your eyes checked. She realizes that the hedgehog she glumped isn't Sonic and apologizes. Of course, Silver loses track of Sonic, but it's okay. Eventually, she volunteers to help Silver find who he's looking for. <laughs> oh, Amy, you sweet, naive girl. If only you knew. Eventually, we find ourselves in Dusty Desert where this time we're inside the temple portion. We clear out this room and... Balls. Big, round, shiny balls. This is something that many a player have experienced with Sonic 2006. The ball mechanic. See, when a ball spawns, its default counter is set to nine. And if you hit it, or if it hits something, the counter drops down a number. And if it reaches zero, it explodes and causes the ball to respawn. Now, in this beginning section where they teach you how it works, it's fine in itself, 
but there's one section in the stage where it's poorly implemented. But for now, we have a small section where we control Amy! Now, Amy controls a little bit like she does in Sonic Adventure, as she can run and use her Pico Pico hammer to attack, but it's been severely nerfed. The hammer is a lot smaller, and you can't propel yourself with a hammer jump. Also, Amy just slams it down like a normal hammer, compared to how she swung her Pico Pico hammer back in Sonic Adventure, which is for sure a lot faster compared to Sonic 2006, where you're slower and you have to wait a while before you can pick up your hammer again and attack another enemy. She can double jump at least, and there were times where her double jump managed to save me from falling into a pit. So not great by any means, but decent enough to play with. Which is a pity because we all know Amy is capable of so much more. We then take control of Silver again, and we come to one of Silver's more infamous moments in Sonic 2006. The Ball Puzzle. Okay, let me set the scene for you. You, as Silver, have to get this ball to the end to open the door. Easy to understand, but boy will this frustrate you. See, the ball, once it starts moving, won't stop, and nothing will stop it. Except maybe a wall. But due to Silver not being fast, like Sonic and Shadow can't quickly change the ball's direction. And you already know what happens when the ball reaches zero. It explodes, and it has to respawn at the beginning of the puzzle. But if it lands in one of the pits that it's not supposed to go in, it has to respawn. And it takes a long time for it to respawn if it falls in one of those pits. Also, I don't know if it's just me, but I feel like every single time I attempt this puzzle, the ball just seemingly likes to navigate towards the pits that it's not supposed to go in. So, here's a good question. Why can't Silver simply pick up the balls with his telekinetic powers? Are they made of some sort of anti-ESP material or something? If it was me designing these levels, I would have made it where Silver could pick up these balls with his powers but enemies will spawn and try to destroy the balls, and you have to fight them off while making sure the ball isn't damaged. This would certainly make it more challenging and engaging, because now I have a reason to make sure these balls don't get damaged. But here, I feel like I have to move a box of TNT by punching it across the room. But here's a tidbit. This entire section, you don't even need to do it. Because of the glitches in this game, you can just simply push yourself through the door and complete the stage. At least, that's what I did for this review. However, I did go back and did it the intended way, but let me tell you, it is a slog to do it this way. Definitely one of the weaker stages for Silver, but it is what it is. After getting through Dusty Desert, we find ourselves back in Soliana. Amy is perplexed on how she didn't find Sonic, but oh. Silver found him all right, because he spots him and proceeds to do his thing and try to kill him. <laughs> now I am the boss! Oh, why bother to fight, Sonic? It's no use! <laughs> anyway, we sucker punch Sonic with our mind. And Amy intervenes. Only now we get to see the results of that. Silver is obviously a little peeved, but not as peeved as Amy is. He tells her that Sonic is responsible for a horrible disaster in the future, and she immediately tells Silver that Sonic would never do something like that. If I had to choose between the world and Sonic, I would choose Sonic! Of course, this does cause Silver to question the morality of all this. We later find him in New City, sitting at the docks, contemplating on his mission. Blaze then shows up and has a chat with Silver. What's wrong? Well, uh, Blaze? To kill someone to save the world. Is that really the right thing to do? You're so naive. Whether it's right or wrong, I can't really say. But what I do know is... 
If we don't take this chance, the future will remain exactly as it is. Since he's after Dr. Eggman, let's sneak into Eggman's base. Maybe we'll learn something new. I think Blaze knows a little more what's going on, but is ultimately tagging along to help guide Silver. We then need to head to White Acropolis, but we need to stop by the shop. Okay, let's talk about the shop real quick. So, throughout all three stories, when you complete the stage, you get a ranking. Yeah, like most 3D Sonic games at the time. What's the deal? Well, in this game, your ranking actually gives you rings, with S being the highest amount you can earn, and they get added with any rings you picked up in the stage. But why do this? Because these floating monitors are actually shops that you can buy upgrades for the three hedgehogs. Now, I'm a little divided on this. On the one hand, I miss finding the actual upgrades themselves in the world or in the stages because it made exploring the stages more fun and rewarding. Yet, at the same time, I don't necessarily hate this shop mechanic, because for one thing, they give the rings actual use as a currency, in addition to their normal use as a shield to make sure you don't die in a single hit. And secondly, it's easy to use. And once you buy an upgrade, it's with you throughout the whole game. No need to rebuy it. So I guess my feelings are just neutral at this point. But tell me what you think in the comments. I'm kind of interested in hearing your thoughts. So with that out of the way, we buy the upgrades we need, and we then proceed to White Acropolis. This time we're playing as Blaze in this section, and it's a lot of fun, because it feels like a Sonic section without the board. And that's more fun if you ask me. We then swap over to Silver and get through the base and complete the stage. Silver and Blaze seem to have missed Sonic and Eggman, but SURPRISE BOSS FIGHT! We get to fight the Egg Genesis again! Only instead of a sunny, open plain, we're in an arctic base. I guess Eggman really likes the cold. It's a little tougher since Silver can't use the homing attack and attack the head of the Egg Genesis. So instead, we resort to chucking things at it! Missiles, robots, even boxes! Eventually, it goes down, but upon its destruction, Silver manages to find the blue Chaos Emerald. That's a Chaos Emerald. Blaze then fills Silver in on what they are, signifying she knows about them and is probably more aware of what's going on than she's letting on. Meanwhile, Amy is in the base looking for Sonic, but realizes she's in way over her head and decides to leave, only for her to bump into Elise and help her escape. We then get this cute little moment with Amy and Elise. I'll bet someone's already on their way to rescue you! Um, yes. But someone I know said to me, nothing starts until you take action. So I decided to heed his advice. Hmm. You wouldn't happen to have some feelings for this person, would you? Uh, Amy. No, of course not. Okay, love changes everything. Uh, Amy. It feels like every little moment in your life is here. Amy! Elise then makes it back to the castle, only to find Eggman is waiting for her there. Silver and Blaze then find Mephilus in the center of town. Silver asks questions about the Iblis trigger to Mephilus, like, who is he? Why does he want to destroy the world? Why does that matter to you? Unless you complete your task, your future will remain the same. Forever. He then tells Silver that Sonic is at the terminal station. It's now or never if you want this. Which means we get to go through Radical Train one last time! And it's all about platforming. And it was fun to do without the need to hurry and prevent a train from blowing up or trying to stop a train. And that felt pretty good to pull off. Just get from point A to point B. We don't even need to chase a train down, we just stop at the end of the tunnel. It's a refreshing change of pace, and it's a good level for Silver. Skipping forward a bit, we now have to fight Shadow! We proceed to kick his butt... And after doing so, we skip forward a bit, and now we're in Aquatic Base. And like with Shadow, Aquatic Base is a decent level for Silver, since it's more of a platforming challenge anyway. Hmm... It seems like the reason Aquatic Base sucked for Sonic was because it wasn't properly designed for Sonic's speed! 
You think? Eventually, Silver catches up to Iblis and is holding him in place with his telekinetic powers. The king comes out carrying Elise. Silver tells him to get out of here, but the king refuses, saying that this living flame has been entrusted to the royal family, and that if it's not properly sealed, the flames of disaster will emerge, and he cannot let that happen. So, using a Chaos Emerald and his own daughter, he incites the royal incantation and seals Iblis inside of Elise. That's right. This power that Elise has is actually Iblis itself. She is a literal walking time bomb. When I first learned of this, I was like, yeah! It's kind of a neat plot twist, especially on Silver's part, because he came back in time to kill the Iblis trigger, and seeing that there was no such thing, and instead we see that Elise is the very key to his future, is just earth-shattering to him. The king then tells Elise to become a brave girl and a good queen, and not to cry, no matter what. Because even if she sheds a single tear, she would unleash Iblis upon the world. Man, this whole Iblis trigger thing just sounds like something straight out of a Dragon Ball Z R. Wait a second. Oh my god! How could I have been so blind? Silver is the sonic equivalent to Future Trunks. It all makes sense! Both travel back in time to prevent a future disaster, both learn what caused said disaster, both face off against world-destroying monsters, and both of them are from the future! It was right in front of us the whole time! And before you think, oh, it's just a coincidence. Coincidence? I think not! It is outright stated in an interview with Shiro Maikawa, a former writer at SEGA, that Silver's character was inspired by Future Trunks. I mean, I know Sonic and Dragon Ball have had some parallels, but never to the point where a character was based on another character. Hey Frieza! What? It's no use! If you're trying to be clever, you're sorely yeah! lacking, huh? Ah! Take this! My baby boy! Eventually, we see the same cutscene of Shadow and Silver gently placing the now unconscious Elise next to a tree and the Scepter of Darkness on the ground, and using Chaos Control to create a rift in space-time and go back to the present. But this time, we see something neat. Silver actually leaves his blue Chaos Emerald with Elise as a lucky charm. Now it all makes sense! The Emerald Elise had at the beginning was actually a gift from Silver. That's how she had it in her possession. Also, you notice how when she looked at Sonic for the first time, she thought about Silver? That was her remembering seeing Silver at the lab accident 10 years ago. Man, I love bootstrap paradoxes, don't you? He then jumps into a portal and makes it back to the present. Blaze tells him of Elise's whereabouts, and Silver is like, OH SHIT! OH SHIT! OH SHIT! And we rush on over to Kingdom Valley, where Silver meets up with Sonic, apologizes for trying to kill him. Yay, friendship. <laughs> we then play Kingdom Valley, and it's a good level. We have Silver using his telekinetic powers to platform and make it through the level, and it's a lot of fun to do. There's even a brief section where we play as Sonic for a bit, and it's just as fun. Kingdom Valley is by far Silver's best level because it makes a good use of Silver's telekinetic powers, as well as that one section where we play a Sonic for a bit. So overall, it's a good stage for both hedgehogs. But we already know what becomes of this. See the egg carrier crash and create a rift in space time using chaos control to go back to an earlier point in time. Only this time we see what becomes of Silver. After Sonic tosses his emerald to Silver, Silver and Blaze return to the future, now having the cyan and white chaos emeralds. And Silver, might be bummed about not changing the future, but he has an idea.
but they need to hunt down Iblis in order for it to work. Blaze can sense his presence, and the two of them make their way to the final stage, Flame Core. Now, as much as I hate Flame Core, with silver, it's actually somewhat decent. Now, it still has a bunch of problems, like getting hit by falling rocks, the enemies, the amount of lava everywhere, but I found myself somewhat enjoying Flame Core. Maybe it has something to do with Silver's focus on platforming, or the fact that at this point in the game, Silver has gotten strong enough to clear out hordes of enemies and can dash with his powers. There's also this one section where Silver has to navigate through this room with a giant flaming orb where it'll slowly grow brighter and brighter until it shoots out a ring of energy, and you have to take cover to avoid getting hit. I like this, and it's a nice way to end the stage, cooling the entirety of Flame Core, and seeing that orc crumble was cool to watch. Whatever it is, Flame Core, as Silver the Hedgehog, is a good time. So, after traveling to the past, learning about everything that led up to this moment, we're finally here taking on Iblis in his complete form. And this is one of the more fun boss fights in Sonic 2006. It's pretty much like his first fight where you have to chuck things at him, but now you have the pressure of Iblis slowly approaching you, destroying pieces of your foothold and fear falling into the magma below. But it's just a matter of taking your time and making sure you have a clear shot at his head and just chucking it right back at him. But once he gets close, you jump onto Iblis' head and give him a telekinetically induced migraine of maximum pain. There's even this one moment where we must play him in a game of volleyball. And after defeating him, we see Iblis has returned to his flame form. And Silver incites the incantation and tries to seal Iblis inside of himself. Even with two emeralds, it's no use. And because Silver isn't of royal blood, and Iblis needs someone of royalty in order for it to work. But then Blaze steps in, stating that she'll seal him. I'll take Iblis. Don't worry. My soul is already alit with flames. I will be accepted. So she manages to do it, but has trouble keeping Iblis inside her. She quickly asks Silver to banish her to another dimension. Silver tries, but he can't do it. You fought alongside me to save the world. You're my friend, right? You're still so naive, but I, I've always liked that about you. And using the power of the two Chaos Emeralds and Iblis' own flames, she briefly transforms into Burning Blaze and banishes herself to another dimension. And we see her fade away. And for the first time, the clouds break open and sunlight hits this flaming world. And all of the magma starts to cool off and turn into rock. The world has been saved. But truly, at what cost? This song, I love this song. In fact, I used to listen to this song all the time on my iPod Touch back when I was going to high school. Listening to this song just takes me back to simpler times. All right, enough reminiscing. We have now finished all three stories. However, since this is a more modern Sonic game, we have to finish the last story in order to be truly done. So let's get through this one really quick. We see Mephilus with the purple chaos emerald. Realizing that his plans and manipulations have failed, he has decided to take matters into his own hands. We see Sonic and Elise walking in a meadow. Assuming they're making their way back to Soliana after that final cutscene in Sonic's story. But they turn around because something caught their attention. The purple Chaos Emerald shines brightly, blinding them, allowing Mephilus to come in from behind. Nothing personnel, kid. <laughs> and with that, 
Mephilus has killed Sonic the Hedgehog. And I mean actually killing him. Man, Mephilus has done something Eggman's been trying to do for 15 years. Get it? Because this was made for the 15th anniversary of Sonic. Yeah, I'll get back to the game. After seeing Sonic die right before her eyes, even though she tries her best, Elise cries over the loss of Sonic. Then, Iblis is freed from his feminine prison. God, this is so anime, it hurts. <laughs> now with Iblis freed, Mephilus and Iblis merge to become whole again, and become the sun god Solaris. And when this happens, all of time converges into a single point. Past, present, and future all exist at the same time, which is why Silver is present here. However, it's not long before everyone notices the dead hedgehog in the room. Everyone takes it hard. Especially Amy. Oh, I just want to hug her. And then Eggman notices that Solaris is consuming all timelines and eventually time itself will collapse and everything will disappear into nothing. Knuckles takes charge and says that they need to do whatever it takes to stop Solaris once and for all. However, Eggman explains that it'd be pointless considering that It is a transcendent life form that exists in the past, present, and future. Defeating it here, now, would do nothing. Oh, but what's this? A Deus Ex Machina? I'm not even sure I'm gonna cover this game. Somehow, Sonic is still alive. But his presence is in the wind. And that is when Silver comes up with the idea of collecting the Chaos Emeralds and having Elise use them to bring Sonic back to life. It should be possible considering she herself was the vessel used to seal Iblis. And that makes her special. Elise agrees to do it. And everyone goes out to find the seven Chaos Emeralds, which have scattered themselves in the stages. These stages are referred to as the end of the world. But really, the only thing notable about them is that they're small sections of previous stages and each character has to navigate to the end of the stage and collect the Chaos Emerald. We start with Tails in Crisis City, where, thanks to his flying abilities, makes getting through the stage a breeze. Also, you'll get introduced to these orb statues, because something you'll notice right away is throughout the stage, everything will slowly have the colors distort and everything being all wobbly, as well as these weird void eyes popping into existence. While touching these orb statues will restore the flow of time, but only for a brief while. Think of these as resetting the timer and clearing out all the voids, because if you get sucked into one, you'll lose a life, and it's really scary just running past these things, because they'll try to pull you in, but you'll be just fast enough to get out of their grasp. So back to the stage. We're now Omega in Flame Core. Honestly, this stage works for Omega because he's got shotgun arms, and you can simply just hover over the large pits of magma. After that, we play as Knuckles in Tropical Jungle. It's the same stage Rouge was in, so we could just glide to the end and grab the emerald. Then we play as Silver in Dusty Desert. And it's a little bit of a challenge, because you have hordes and hordes of enemies. And not only will these void eyes start to appear, but then you have what I call the spitter eyes popping in. They do the exact opposite and spit things at you, hoping to knock you off balance so that you fall into the void. It's really bothersome over this pit of sand, where remember, if you fall into the sand, you'll sink and die. But after that, you climb up a tower and grab the emerald. Then we play as Rouge in Wave Ocean. We just simply have to glide across the ocean and get to the beach where Tails needed to hit the gate switch in the beginning of Sonic's story. Then we play as Amy in White Acropolis. Making her way downtown, walking fast, faces pass and she's homebound. And then we cap things off with Shadow in Kingdom Valley. And what can I say? It's Sonic's section of Kingdom Valley, but we play as Shadow. Now, my only gripe is that when you get to here, steer clear from the top, because those monster worm things will pop out and make you fall into the abyss below. Also, a side note, if you lose all your lives in one of the stages, you have to do the entire run all over again. 
which is super annoying and time consuming. But as long as you don't rush it and don't try to do anything stupid, you'll make it through. Hooray! We have all seven Chaos Emeralds. Elise chants a prayer. And then we see one of the most infamous cutscenes to hit the Sonic franchise and fandom back in 2006. Elise kisses Sonic and she brings him back to life and is transformed into Super Sonic. Now, I don't have much of an issue since she's literally breathing life back into Sonic, but I can see how weird this is considering we have a somewhat realistic girl kissing a cartoon hedgehog. But with that out of the way, we then see Sonic transform Shadow and Silver to Super Shadow and Super Silver. And then, we come into the final boss of the whole game! Here is how the fight works. You have to swap to the other hedgehogs representing different periods in time and damage Solaris to weaken him. Shadow representing the past, Sonic representing the present, and Silver representing the future. And in order for you to damage him, you have to charge the action gauge with the right trigger and once it's fully charged, you fire with the X button. Shadow will use Chaos Lance. Sonic will charge into Solaris. And Silver will use his telekinetic powers to catch Solaris' attacks and fling them right back at him. But you have to be careful, because you have to switch to another hedgehog if you're getting low on rings. And if you run out of rings, you'll lose your super form and fall into the void, losing a life and starting over. At least if you lose all your lives with Solaris, you don't have to do the end of the world again. And there's actually two phases. The first form of Solaris, you have to break apart its armor to reveal the core underneath, but you have to do it in a certain order. First, you have to fight Solaris with Silver, flinging his attack right back at him until his left arm's armor breaks off. Then you switch over to Shadow and keep firing until his right arm's armor breaks off. And then with Sonic, charge off the action gauge, wait for an opening, and charge right into him. Eventually, Solaris will be defeated, and he'll return in his second form. Here is where it's an all-out fight, and all attacks will hurt him. However, he's only vulnerable when he fires his lasers, so it's probably best to stick with Shadow and Sonic for this fight. But I managed to beat him with Silver. My core is the hardest. And with that final hit, Solaris is defeated. Time is restored, and Solaris returns to its true form. A small, white flame. We then see a flashback of the King and Young Elise. The King explains that the small white flame is Solaris. He hopes that once the flame grows big enough, they'll be able to use Solaris for time travel rectifying mistakes of the past, and possibly to prevent his wife's death. The King and Young Elise leave. The room returns to normal color, and we see Sonic and Elise walk in. Elise explains that if Solaris is blown out, all of the events that happened in this game, past, present, and future, would have never happened. The flames of disaster would never bring death and destruction to the future. The explosion that happened 10 years ago would never take place. Blaze banishing herself would not happen. And that Eggman would have never attacked Soliana. But this also means Elise would lose the only friend she's ever made, which is Sonic. But he comforts her and tells her to just smile. Comforted by Sonic's words and knowing it's probably for the best, she blows out Solaris, resetting time, and we are greeted to the beginning of the game again. But this time, no Eggman, no robots, and no explosions. We also get to see what Sonic was doing before Eggman crashed the ceremony. He was just passing by, taking in the sights, which is fitting with our blue boy. He then runs past a crowd of people, Elise feels a presence in the wind, and Sonic watches the festival of the sun from the rooftops. We then see a feather drift into the night sky, and Sonic looking towards the moon, and possibly the future. And then, credits. And that was Sonic 2006. So, what does this mean for the game? Well, 
can definitely say that Sonic 2006 isn't as bad as everyone was making it out to be. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying this game is perfect or anything like that, far from it, but it certainly isn't a train wreck either. I do agree the bugs and glitches are just bad, but in my playthrough I didn't come across that many glitches to begin with, except for that one in Dusty Desert with Silver, but that was more of a beneficial thing. Do I agree there are some elements of the story that are convoluted as all get out? Of course, but I'd be lying if I didn't say I love how convoluted it is. It could have been written better, but I think with how cheesy it is, I'd say it works in its favor these days. Now, the whole real people thing is just bad. I get they were trying to do something new with Sonic and push him in a new direction, but like I said, cartoony visuals would have worked better. And I don't think we need a bunch of side quests to move the story. I think it would have been better if said side quests were taken out. However, there's still a bunch of things I need to cover, or at least mention. First off, remember when I said that Sonic had a special ability with the action gauge? Well, he actually has seven of them. Through the use of these gems, aptly called Power Gems. See, in one of the side quests that you have to do, Sonic will get access to special customizable shoes, and you can equip a gem onto the shoes. And they not only change the color of Sonic's shoes, but they also give Sonic a unique ability whenever you use them. However, I couldn't get every single power gem, because I didn't have enough rings to buy them all. But I'll do a brief description and do rough sketches. The blue gem allows Sonic to run at full speed, the red gem slows down time, the green gem allows Sonic to do a tornado move, the white gem allows Sonic to hold a homing attack mid-air, the sky gem allows Sonic to throw a gem and wherever it lands, Sonic will be instantly teleported to it. Think Ender Pearls. The yellow gem allows Sonic to do Thunder Guard, which is this game's version of the lightning shield, but less cool and only attracts rings. And the purple gem, which just makes Sonic really tiny. It also allows him to infinitely jump, but overall it's kind of useless. Now, I've never really used them because you can get through these levels without them, but I will say this. You know how when you use the action gauge, the meter is supposed to go down like with Shadow's Chaos Boost or Silver's Telekinesis? Well, Sonic's gauge never goes down. Meaning, as long as you hold the right trigger, Sonic can use the power of these gems Indefinitely. Indefinitely. Which makes clearing a lot of the side quests with Sonic a breeze. And if you really wanted to use these in the stage, the red gem is by far the best one to use, because it slows everything down, including the in-game clock, where you could easily cheese S-ranks in some of these levels. Okay, so that's cool, but... What was with the whole weird romantic connection between Sonic and Elise? I mean, what's the deal with that? Well, believe it or not, it actually has something to do with the first Sonic. See, back then, when Sonic was still in the early stages of development, Sega really wanted to drive home the point that not only Sonic was meant to be a rival to Nintendo, but also cooler than Mario. Ah! So they first thought of giving him similar things Mario has, but make it cooler. Mario is all about jumping. Sonic is all about speed. Mario fights a monster. Sonic fights an evil scientist who wants to destroy the environment. Mario rescues a sweet princess. So Sonic should rescue a hot, sexy girlfriend. This is Madonna. And yes, that's what her name was. She was a character cut from the development of Sonic the Hedgehog. Her whole deal was that she would have originally chased Sonic through the levels, and eventually, that was scrapped. And soon, it shifted into Eggman, who not only wanted to collect the Chaos Emeralds in the game, but also kidnapped Madonna, and Sonic was meant to rescue her. But eventually, it didn't work out, and she ended up getting scrapped entirely. I can see what they were going for, trying to catch that whole Roger Rabbit and Jessica Rabbit aesthetic. A cartoon dude with a bombshell babe. 
but it just doesn't work. And eventually, that whole chasing Sonic around the levels thing would later end up being one of the inspirations for Amy. Yay! My guess is that they wanted to reuse that idea and see if they could get it to work. However, it didn't work. In fact, if you were to ask me, they made it even worse. Because you have a realistic looking girl kissing a cartoon hedgehog. And you could tell they really wanted to push the whole Sonic and Elise thing on us. There is literally a side quest in the game that you have to do in order to move the story. In this side quest, you have to complete three tests in order to open the way for Kingdom Valley. And one of the tests is the test of love. And you have to pick either Elise or Amy. Now, obviously, I picked Amy because I am qualified Sun Amy trash. However, it doesn't really matter anyway because it doesn't affect the story at all. This is closer to a hot gossip sesh than trying to prove that you are worthy of being a hero. Also, remember what I said about playing a game so he focused on silver? Well, originally there was going to be a silver focused game. It would have been part of a hedgehog focused trilogy. Shadow the Hedgehog was the first in this trilogy, and then we got Sonic 2006. And Silver would have capped it off. His game would have delved more into puzzle focused platforming using his telekinetic powers. However, since Sonic 2006 was poorly received by both critics and fans, Sega ultimately scrapped this idea. Which is a shame if you ask me, because I would have loved to play a game solely focused on this plant loving nerd. In fact, I would love to play a game solely focusing on any of Sonic's friends, but that's a discussion for another day. There's also a multiplayer mode, but it's nothing to write home about. So overall, I know that Sonic 2006 is not a great game. It is, however, a decent experience with an awesome soundtrack, some clever level design, and some really cheesy dialogue. Now, I obviously wouldn't recommend 100% completing it and getting everything. I would, however, recommend playing it with some friends on a game night and just have some silly fun. Now, normally, I wouldn't do ratings or anything like that when it comes to talking about games. But if I were to give this a rank, I'd give it a B. It could do better, but it's passable as it is. You really think that? Yeah, I mean, you're not the best game, but you're not a terrible game either. Your developers rushed you and made bad decisions. The internet may give you flack for it, but at least you still have me. Th thanks. I... I really appreciate it. I can... finally be at rest. Thank you, Speedy Four. Well, that just happened. Uh, thank you so much for watching this video and for getting me to a thousand subscribers. All of you mean so much to me and I appreciate the support. Now, let's see if the next goal we can hit is 3,000 subscribers. But before I go, let me ask you guys one important question. Do you guys wanna see these videos before they come out? Do you wanna help support the channel? Well, if you said yes to either one of those two, then you should consider joining my Patreon where you can help support Macho 64 in a small way. There's the $1 tier where you'll get your name at the end of the credits, as well as access to special channels in the official Macho 64 Discord. 
There's the $3 tier, where you'll get everything from the $1 tier, as well as getting a custom icon representing you, either provided by you or made by me, as well as getting a shout out at the end of the video. And the $5 tier, where you'll get a custom wallpaper drawn by me of your OC, Persona, Persona, or just your favorite character from a video game, anime, comic, or cartoon. It's 100% optional, but the support does go a long way with helping me make this channel better. So if you want to join, just go to www.patreon.com slash speedy4. Now, I did mean what I said about Sonic 2006. While there is some questionable dialogue and some bad glitches here and there, Sonic 2006 is not the worst Sonic game. It's not the worst Sonic game because this one is! Oh yeah, and 3,000 subs, I'm gonna take a look at this trash. Thank you so much for watching. Also, thank you to any artists who drew my cute little mascot, Arrow the Dragon. I love seeing other people draw her in their styles. It just makes my day. If you like this video, then give it a like! And don't forget to hit that subscribe button. It'll let you know the moment I upload a new video, whether it be a short funny clip, art videos, or new episodes of Montreal 64. And when you want to know the exact moment I upload a video, don't forget to hit that notification bell. Now. I don't like to bring this up, but I got to because 87.6% of you people that are watching these videos are not subscribed to the channel. You clearly like watching my content, so why not hit the subscribe button? It's free, and you get quality content for your viewing pleasure. Don't forget to check out my Patreon if you want to support the channel, or if you perhaps want a one-and-done approach, don't forget to check out my Tee Public, Redbubble, and Display stores. You get some cool unique shirts, posters, mugs, or even throw pillows! Some of that money even goes to me so I can keep this channel going. Again, all these things are 100% optional, but I always appreciate the support. Now, it's time to thank the patrons! A special thank you to Lori, my only $3 patron. That box icon is looking adorable, as usual. And a massive thank you to my $5 patron, Callus Vallis, the champion of anime waifus and Smash. Your support is super appreciated, and Byleth and Pichu make for an unlikely but effective team. We also got a brand new $5 patron. Ladies and gentlemen, give a warm welcome to... Garuka Wanoa, Game of Princess of Terraria! She be looking heckin' adorable. And that Aerith plushie? Mmm, <clears throat> good stuff. And once again, thank you all so much for watching, and until next time, I'll see you later.